Okay, thank you. So before uh, we begin, can I please remind members and witnesses to turn off mobile phones? Uh, interference obviously affects the transmission of the meeting. I'd like to welcome today um, our witnesses from the Economic and Social Research Institute, Dr. Adele Bergen, Senior Researcher Officer with the ESRI, and her colleague, Professor Kieran McQuinn, Research Professor with the ESRI. Um, unfortunately, I gather Dr. Martina Lawless, who co-authored the research, is unable to attend our hearing team today. But the purpose of this meeting is to examine the detailed analysis of the impact of the different types of Brexit on Ireland. The ESRI and the Department of Finance recently published this detailed analysis. The Committee's focus is on the budgetary and fiscal impact of Brexit, given our ongoing events in Westminster. It's timely that we are discussing this topic today which is probably a line that could have been said on any day <laughs> over the last few weeks. Um, I'm very grateful, obviously, to the director uh, of the ESRI, Professor Alan Barish, for facilitating our request for a meeting on this important piece of research. Now, just to do the little bit of housekeeping in relation to privilege, uh, before we hear opening statements, just to draw witnesses' attention to the position on privilege, which is that you are advised by virtue section 17.2i of the Defamation Act 2009. Witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to their evidence to the committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence on a particular matter and continue to do so, you're entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make changes against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House's an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So with that bit of housekeeping done, Dr Bergen, I would now invite you to make your opening statement and thank you obviously again for being with us here today. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me begin by thanking the Chairman for the invitation to the ESRI to appear before you today. I'm Dr. Adele Bergen, and I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Kieran McQuinn, who is Head of Economics in the ESRI. We have been asked to discuss a recent paper, Ireland and Brexit, Modelling the Impact of Deal and No Deal Scenarios, which was published in the Spring 2019 Quarterly Economic Commentary. The paper attempts to quantify the macroeconomic impact of Brexit on the Irish economy. I will start by summarising the range of scenarios considered and then outline some of the key findings for the macro economy, for trade, the labour market, households and the public finances. So on the Brexit scenarios, um, owing to the current heightened political uncertainty in the UK, we consider a range of Brexit scenarios. We also acknowledge the uncertainty around any assessment of the economic impact of Brexit as there is no precedent of a country leaving uh, a major and closely integrated trading bloc such as the EU. The paper considers three scenarios which we describe as deal, no deal and disorderly no deal. To estimate the economic impact of each scenario, we compare them to a counterfactual scenario where the UK remains in the EU. In the deal scenario, the UK makes an orderly agreed exit from the EU. This involves a transition period to the end of 2020 and a free trade agreement between the UK and the EU27 being in place thereafter. In the no deal scenario, the UK exits the EU without a deal, but there is an orderly period of adjustment for trade. Ultimately, WTO tariff arrangements will apply to good, goods trade, there will be non-tariff non measures, and services trade will also be negatively impacted. In the disorderly no-deal scenario, the UK exits the EU without a deal, and there is additional disruption to trade in the short run, above that considered in the no-deal scenario. So our analysis focuses on the most well understood channels through which Brexit will affect Ireland, namely through lower trade, uh, incorporating the impact of tariff and non-tariff measures and the potentially positive impact of um, FDI diversion to, to Ireland. Our approach is to build up estimates of each of these channels from a range of recent Brexit microeconomic studies, so our estimates are anchored in the empirical literature. We then use these micro-estimates to calibrate um, macroeconomic scenarios. So specifically, we generate alternative paths for the UK and the international economy using the NIGEM global model of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research in the UK, 
and then assess the impact on Ireland using the ESRI's Cosmo macroeconometric model. The impact of each Brexit scenario is considerable and will have negative effects on the macroeconomy and throughout the economy on trade, the labour market, the household sector and the public finances. So I'll briefly outline the key impacts for each of these. Um, on the macro impact, the um, macroeconomic effect of, of, uh, effects of Brexit are significant and negative for the Irish economy. We find that GDP, the, the level of output in Ireland, in the longer term could be around 2.6% lower in a deal scenario, 4.8% lower in a no deal scenario, and 5% lower in a disorderly no deal scenario, compared to a situation where the UK stays in the EU. While some of these effects may not appear substantial, it has to be borne in mind that these impacts will accumulate over a long period of time. In each scenario, the level of Irish output is below where it otherwise would have been. The negative impact on Irish output in the long run in the deal scenario is, is approximately half that of the no deal scenario. Although these are substantial relative reductions in the level of output over the long run, it is important to state that the Irish economy will continue to grow, but at a slower pace as a consequence of Brexit. If we assume the Irish economy would grow by an average of 3% per annum over the long run if the UK were to stay in the EU, the impact of Brexit is roughly equivalent to a 0.3 percentage point reduction in the long run growth rate in the deal scenario and around 0.6 percentage points off the long run growth rate in the no deal and disorderly no deal scenarios. There is more uncertainty around the short run impact of Brexit as it depends on how smooth any transition to the future arrangements between the UK and, and EU um, is. Our results suggest that by 2020 the level of real output in the Irish economy could be around 0 0.6, 1.2 and 2.4% lower in the deal, no deal and disorderly uh, no deal scenarios respectively. Again, these results are compared to a situation where the UK remains in the EU. Um, so moving on to trade, our results also indicate that firms will be negatively affected as a result of Brexit. The negative trade shock will reduce the demand for Irish exports and Irish firms will be affected by the depreciation in sterling which will reduce our competitiveness. Our results indicate that exports in the long run will be 4.6% um, lower in a deal scenario, 8.1% um, lower in a no deal scenario and 8.3% lower in a disorderly no deal scenario compared to a situation where the UK stays in the EU. Um, on, on the labour market, lower output in the long run compared to a situation where the UK remains in the EU will result in lower labour demand, which has knock-on impacts for employment and the unemployment rate. Our results indicate that employment in the long run would be 1.8% lower in a deal scenario, 3.2% lower in a no deal scenario, and 3.4% lower in a disorderly no deal scenario. Um, again, compared to a situation where the UK stays in the EU. Uh, this represents around 40,000 fewer jobs created uh, in the long run in a deal scenario um, and around 80,000 fewer jobs created in the long run in the two no deal scenarios. Again, it's important to state that employment will continue to grow in each scenario, but at a slower pace um, than compared to a situation where the UK remains in the EU. Um, in the long run, the unemployment rate is one percentage point higher in the deal scenario and roughly two percentage points higher in the two no deal scenarios uh, compared uh, to a situation where the UK stays in the EU. Uh, turning to households, uh, for households the impact of Brexit will be severe. Our results indicate that real personal disposable income in the long run would be 2.2% lower in a deal scenario, 3.9% lower in a no deal scenario and 4.1% lower in a disorderly no deal scenario compared to a situation where the UK stays in the EU. This is driven by lower employment, lower wages and higher prices. As a result, consumption will be lower in the long run. Furthermore, households will face higher prices as a result of the imposition of tariffs or other increases in trading costs that could be passed on as increased prices for Irish consumers. Um, and then on the, on the public finances, with both output and employment below base, uh, below where they otherwise would have been in the absence of Brexit, government revenue from taxes will be lower and the increase in the unemployment rate would lead to higher government spending on welfare payments. 
The net effect is a deterioration in the general government balance as a percent of GDP. In the long run, this could reduce the GGB by around uh, 0.5 percentage points in, in a deal scenario and by um, around 0.9 percentage points in a no deal and disorderly no deal scenario. We have also looked at the short-term forecast for the public finances from the spring 2019 quarterly economic commentary and examined the implications of Brexit for the public finances in the short run. The short-term short, short -term forecasts for the public finances in the recent QEC are done on the basis of a no-Brexit scenario. They show a deficit on the GGB of 0.3% of GDP in 2019 and a deficit of 0.4% of GDP in 2020. This is equivalent to um, 0.9 billion euro in 2019 and 1.5 billion euro in 2020. Our results suggest that for 2019, the impact of our deal and no deal scenario is more limited on the GGB. However, the deficit on the GGB could be 0.2 percentage points higher. That's roughly um, 0.7 billion euro uh, in the case of a disorderly no deal scenario. In 2020, the deficit on the GGB could be around 0.1 percentage points higher in our deal scenario or no deal scenario, um, equivalent to around 0.2 and 0.4 billion euro respectively, and uh, 0.3 percentage points higher or about 1.1 billion in the disorderly no deal scenario. In each of these scenarios, we assume that there's no explicit fiscal policy response to the change in the economic environment. So many thanks for your attention, and my colleague and I would be delighted to take any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your opening remarks there. I have a number of deputies who have indicated uh, to speak. So in the order in which people have indicated, Deputy Chambers. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you very much, Ms. Bergen, for your, your opening statement. Um, obviously, Brexit poses one of the most significant challenges and threats to our economy that I think I'll probably see in my lifetime. And, certainly for many, many years. Um, you, you speak about three different scenarios. Can you just explain what you mean by um, kind of a managed no deal? Because my understanding is that's not actually on the table. Um, it's either a deal or it's no deal. And that the transition period to 2020 is being offered, that it's, it's contingent on there being a deal ratified. Um, so why did you choose to explore a scenario that the European Union have ruled out? Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for that, for that question, Deputy, and, and let me try to, to clarify uh, on this. Um, I suppose we know that in the long run, the relationship between the UK and the EU is going to change. Um, and so uh, as a result, we know that the, the, the level of output in, in the Irish economy is going to be below where it otherwise would have been. Um, when we think about a, a no-deal scenario, there's more uncertainty around the, kind of the, the potential short-run impact of Brexit. Um, so we don't know whether the adjustment to this new relationship, it could be more sudden, um, it could be a more, a more gradual adjustment. Um, you can also imagine a situation where there could be additional disruption in the short run, which is what we've done in our disorderly no deal scenario. Um, so we're not, um, the, the, the fact that we've called it a no deal scenario where we've sort of suggested that there be a more orderly period of adjustment for trade, that, that's not assigning it to a particular scenario that the, the, the EU uh, or anyone has or has not agreed to. It's more saying that the adjustment to the long run will be a more kind of sudden, or sorry, will be a more gradual adjustment. Mm -hmm. So it's just it, what we were trying to do in, 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 as well in terms of having a disorderly no deal scenario is to allow for the fact that there could just be additional disruption in, in the short run. So we sort of felt that we had to consider a, a range of, of different scenarios just to try to, to capture what, what, what may actually happen. So just that... Second, I should have said it just at the very start before uh, I, I, I brought in the deputy. Just our normal rules of approximately five minutes per deputy in terms of questioning, and then a second round should people require it, just to make everybody aware of that. Sorry, Deputy Chair. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Chair. So just to be clear, that the middle scenario, the no deal uh, scenario, you're not suggesting that wasn't based on there being a transition period. That's still a, a cliff edge, no deal. Yes. That, that, that was my point. Yeah. Thank you. Just I'll, I'll run through my questions so all together then, Chair. That might be a bit easier. Um, the, the Parliamentary Budget Office issued a, a report not so long ago, um, I suppose highlighting the fact that government's budget planning was based on the central case um, that the UK would remain within the European Union and um, didn't really account for the possibility of a no-deal cliff-edge scenario. 
Um, I suppose, and the question that we would have put to the Minister for Finance on several occasions in this committee, you know, was Budget 2019 sufficient to deal with a, to, with a, to deal with a no-deal scenario, given that all of the projections were based on there being a deal um, or an orderly exit? The response from the Minister has always been that the budget that's been done for 2019 is fine, it's sufficient, and there'll be no need for a supplementary budget. Uh, would, that, would you share the view of the Minister in that regard? Um, what impact also do you think that, budget, that the Brexit process, whatever happens, whether it be a deal or a no-deal scenario, what that might have on budget 2020? So for the next budget, that we'll be, we will be considering that, obviously, post the summer recess. Um, just in terms of the three scenarios that you've looked at, did you take a regional look at, uh, like, analyse the impact of Brexit on the regions? Um, my own area would be more kind of the northwest, and uh, my concern, as is the concern of many others in that region, would be the particular impact on tourism and agri-food, probably our two biggest economic drivers in that region. In your view, is the government doing all it can to prepare for Brexit? Um, are you satisfied that the financial planning being done by the department is sufficient? And are we as prepared um, as best we can be? And you just touched slightly on the one little positive uh, from Brexit, and that's the potential increase of FDI. What are your short-term um, projections for an increase in FDI? I think kind of more medium to long-term. We are looking at maybe an, an increase when the UK is, has fully exited. But in the short term, do you see that as being part of the buffer that might protect the country um, and maybe offset some of the damage across other sectors? Thank you. OK, <clears throat> thanks very much, Stephanie, uh, for the questions. I think they're hugely relevant. Um, on on the, the issue of the 2019 budget, it's interesting you'd ask the question because um, you know, we release a, a commentary just before uh, uh, each budget, and I suppose you know we're obviously um, we're thinking about the kind of stance that we would suggest and recommend to government. And I know if you uh, uh, if you recall back in the autumn of last year, I suppose there were some calls amongst commentators, and they're perfectly legitimate in many respects, uh, for a contractionary budget. The feeling was the economy was overheating, and you know that there was you know a lot of uh, pressures growing in the economy, and uh, etc. And our, our reflection on that at the time was that really um, we felt that it was still optimal for the government to pursue what we called a neutral policy, so basically a policy that wouldn't stimulate the economy nor be contractionary. And we offered two reasons for that. One was we felt there was a real danger of a no-deal outcome, a uh, Brexit outcome, and as a result that you, the economy would be hit by a substantial economic shock as a result, and that if you were at the same time implementing a contractionary budgetary policy, you would effectively be complement or compounding the, the, the adverse shock that, that would result from that. The other reason we said was that we felt we still felt there was a need to continue uh, investment in key resources, particularly, in, for instance, in the housing area. So that's what, we, that's what we suggested. Now, I think in broad terms, most commentators would probably have felt that the budget, uh, the 2019 budget, wasn't neutral. If anything, it was uh, uh, slightly on the stimulatory side. Um, so I think overall, and even if you take the implications for the public finances that, that Adele outlined under an adverse case, um, you know, clearly they show a significant potential increase in the deficit. And that's obviously something that one would be slightly uh, concerned about. Uh, and in particular, I suppose, we have to be mindful of the fact that the budgetary position last year was uh, somewhat massaged, shall we say, by the, very, by the bumper corporation tax receipts. Corporation tax receipts, as you probably know, went up by over 20% last year, even though the Department of Finance uh, only expected them to increase by 4%. So the slightly underlying, um, you know, the, the headline position last year, the, the surplus that was recorded last year, it wasn't, uh, you know, quite truly reflective of the underlying position, and that's reflected in our forecast for this year and next year. We believe there'll be a return to the deficit. So I think the bottom line is that whilst there is a deterioration clearly under the adverse case, I still think it's within the broad budgetary parameters. So I, I don't personally think um, at this stage there is need for a supplementary budget. Uh, I do think there is a case for the government to pursue at, very le at the very least a neutral policy, and may even, you know. Uh, if you like, I won't say be explicitly counter-cyclical in terms of increasing expenditure to offset the impact, but I wouldn't, for instance, go 
uh, to the other extreme, which is to suggest that we should have implemented the contractionary policy to offset overheating pressure. So I think in broad terms, I, I don't really think we need a, a supplementary budget, even under these kind of circumstances. But obviously you would have to keep, a, keep a, a, an eye on the situation, and in particular, I suppose, keep an eye on the revenue side, um, in particular what happens to key taxation aggregates like corporation tax, which were, as I said, uh, recorded very, very substantial increases, um, increases last year. Um, on the regional uh, aspect to it, and feel free Adele to come in at this, I mean, I think we, we've, the, the work that Adele did, and I wasn't directly involved in it so I can kind of say this, I think it was very, very beneficial in a number of respects because A, it, it used the kind of standard tools that we use in the Institute, the, the big macro model, which can kind of feed in a lot of the outside shocks that obviously will come about due to Brexit. But it also leveraged off um, a lot of micro work that we've been doing in the Institute. So my colleagues, Martina Lawless uh, in particular, has done a lot of micro level work going, looking in at the sectoral issues. And in fact, she's published uh, quite a few papers on this. And, and those, that analysis of hers has really stressed, I suppose, the regional dimension to the issue as well. That in particular, uh, she's looked at the sectors that we be most impacted. And clearly, as we all know now, nearly at this stage, I think it's agriculture and the related food processing sector, it's tourism. These are the sectors which uh, could be particularly impacted. And obviously, these are sectors which have a very specific regional imprint. I mean, one of the interesting um, aspects of her work that came out uh, was that, you know, we all associate, from a regional perspective, we all think of the border area clearly as being an area that would be particularly impacted. But her analysis also suggested that certain parts, for instance, of, of Munster, for example, uh, which are very heavily reliant on uh, agricultural income as a main source of income in those areas, that these are other regions which could be particularly impacted. Um, and of course you, have, you can have potentially quite a broad spread in terms of the impact. So for instance, we've done a lot of work as well uh, uh, in looking at Brexit on, for instance, the housing market. And in that instance, you see quite a broad regional spread in terms of the implications. So clearly for uh, areas outside of Dublin uh, and outside even to a lesser extent outside of Cork and Limerick, there's adverse implications for, for the housing market. But in Dublin, you could see actually uh, an increase in demand for housing because of if we do have a lot of people coming to, to, to work. So I think there's, uh, as I said, I think we've done quite a lot of work looking at the regional aspects and, and, and certainly those are things that we're very, uh, very mindful of in, in the analysis that we've conducted. Um, just coming in on some of your uh, other questions, Deputy, um, you, you asked how prepared we are for, for Brexit. Um, to be honest, that's a really tough question to, to, to answer. Um, I, I know the government has, has, has released various uh, uh, documents uh, on, in terms of its planning, um, and that there's been a widespread information campaign, um, but we don't really know exactly what's going on but behind the scenes. Um, I suppose... Um, it's incredibly challenging, I think, for, for firms and, and for, for everyone in general to prepare for something when we don't know what kind of Brexit we're going to have. And um, uh, as of right now, we can't even tell you when, it's, when exactly it's going to happen. So I think if we, maybe if, if say, if, if six months ago, if we knew, even if it was going to be the, the, the kind of the, 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 the bad case of a no deal, even if we knew that, you, you know, you could have intensified planning or, or whatever over the past six months. So I think really um, the, the only thing that, that firms can do and, and, I, and, 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 and the government and, and I suppose everyone in general is to, is to plan for the worst but hope for the best. Um, so, so I hope that that answers your question. On, on FDI, um, what we have in, in our deal scenario, we assume that the, the positive um, impact from FDI would begin at the end of the transition period, so not until uh, the end of 2020. Um, in, in the two no deal scenarios, we actually have a beginning straight away. Um, but again, it's just really important to state that the, the overall negative um, coming from the trade shock um, by far outweighs any positive on, on the FDI side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Deputy um, Bruin is next. Yeah, thanks, Carol. Yeah, just to, I, I suppose the highlight we took, took from your, country, uh, your, your um, presentation is the, the fact of, of that there will be um, a very severe impact on households. Um, and that, if you know, from employment terms, in terms of higher prices and so on, across the board, households are going to be really, really struggling. Does that therefore make a case that uh, we need to be possibly support the European Union, uh, looking for more 
uh, you know, significant social transfers, for example, uh, and, and other kind of supports to try and help families, because uh, obviously households, um, and, and particularly those um, you know, where there's nobody working and so on, are going to be in the most vulnerable situation. Um, that's, that's just the first point. Just, just uh, secondly, just to ask you, I mean, are you being a little bit too sanguine about all of this, uh, in the sense that, um, you know, when we've seen, as, as, as we seem to get closer to Brexit, and I mean, I don't know, could we still be talking about Friday or whatever? If, if, as we get closer, um, I mean, uh, forecasts seem to be getting more and more kind of scarier. Or uh, do I, like, do, does your Cosmo model, are you putting in different inputs into it as we get closer? For example, I mean, we all note it in relation to uh, the euro and sterling possibly moving to parity. And, and um, um, you know, the, the, that type of impact, the kind of impact that that would have on, say, tourism and on, um, you know, on, on our, 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 our agriculture industry alone, um, etc. You know, so, so is, it, is it as we get closer and begin to realise the profound implications, um, um, particularly if we don't get the kind of supports we need from the European Union, um, is, it, is it getting uncertain? And is your model... The model that you're using, um, you know, are you, uh, is it possible to, to, to therefore to um, uh, input the, those kind of issues? And just the, the last brief point, uh, you know, you say that there is no models. You know, if you go back a little bit further in history, though, are there not models? I don't know whether there would be any research. Would, uh, it really would be our historian colleagues rather than the economists. But in relation to where, you know, for, for example, we left the British Empire, I would say. Um, the, you know, where states have, have several, the Czechs and the Slovaks and so on. Is there anything at all in, in the literature about that, about where uh, you know somebody left a trading block and, and what the implications could have been. Thanks, Carlo. Um, yeah, thanks very much again, Deputy. <clears throat> I think just on the households again, just to refer back to some previous work that was done again by my colleague Martina Lawless, where she looked at the impact on household expenditure of the uh, on, on household budgets in general of the kind of likely increase in, in, in prices that they would face and, and, and again you know quite detailed work looking at the, the impact and you know again it's, it's quite significant if you look at the, the, the overall impact I think you know she was talking about a range of potentially nine to 900 euros to 1400 euros being added to the typical budget of a household because of higher import prices so um, she would have looked at the various different sectors of the economy that were likely to, to have WTO tariffs applied and then look at the knock-on impacts on, on the average household spend here domestically as a result of that. So, I mean, those are substantial increases, uh, and in particular, a lot of those increases tend to be at, um, tend to hit families at the lower end of the distribution because of their disproportionate reliance on products that will have potentially tariffs applied to them. So, um, there's, there's no doubt at a, at a micro level, uh, in terms of the, the, the household implications, they, they, they can be quite, quite significant. Um, on the issue of, of, of obtaining additional transfers from Europe, I mean, I suppose the only point I, I, I would make in relation to that is that if you look at how the Irish economy, unfortunately we could be victims of our own success, if you look at how the Irish economy has performed over the last four to five years, I mean, our, our performance, albeit the fact that we've been coming from a low base and after the financial crisis, the fact is we've had very substantial growth rates. Uh, and I think just from a negotiating point of view, it almost would be one could see a difficulty in convincing European partners that we, we need to get additional social transfers when our economy has been growing at three, four, five times the rate of the average European economy over that period. So I think that, that, that could be a, certainly could be an issue. But obviously, I suppose, if we do reach a, a situation where uh, we have a very dramatic impact on, on, on households, then m maybe that could be looked at. In terms of being sanguine about all of this, I, I mean, I think... There's always a danger, clearly, with models. I mean, that there are, there, there's limitations to models, in particular, I suppose, in the context of the present study. I mean, it's very, very difficult to get a handle on a country in, in a relatively unprecedented situation, removing itself from a, a, a currency, or sorry, from a trading union, as is the proposed case. But I think Adele, and Adele can document it herself, they, they've done a lot of kind of stress testing of the model to kind of see, well, you know, for instance, like what kind of effect would you need to get uh, what kind of trade effect, for instance, would you need to get to kind of have the kind of effect on headline GDP that we saw after the financial crisis? And the effect is, would be, you know, you'd need to get a massive trade impact altogether 
for the economy to pretty much collapse in the way in which it did in 2008, 2009, when we had the collapse of the credit bubble uh, and that. So I, I, I do take your point that there's always a danger you can be a bit sanguine about this, but I think there has been a fair amount of, 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 of stress testing, if you like, and, and uh, uh, analysis done to kind of um, underpin the, the analysis. But. Yeah, I, I, so I just might add to, to what Kieran said on, on that. I suppose in this paper we are focusing on, on the main channels through which Brexit will impact Ireland through, through lower trade and a, and a small positive from FDI. Some of the other factors that, that you mentioned yourself, um, uh, Deputy, around exchange rates, we do factor in uh, significant depreciation for sterling. Um, and uh, I think in our disorderly scenario, sterling could be around um, 0 0.9 feet, 0 0.95p in the short run. But that could involve over in 2019, 2020. But that could involve sterling going to parity um, uh, for, for, for a short uh, period of time. Um, I, I think that what we've looked at in the paper are the generally accepted channels through which Brexit will impact Ireland. Um, and I, I think there is some consensus uh, uh, um, um, a, a, around that. Um, the other thing that we did here that I think is, is quite important is um, we drew on a lot of other evidence, a lot, particularly as Karen has already mentioned, a lot of other microeconomic evidence to try to get a handle on, um, you know, our, could it be higher, could it be lower, to try to, to get to, to make sure that we were using the best possible evidence. And, and then we use that to, um, to, to generate our, our, our scenarios. So I suppose it is our considered view of the most likely impact of, of Brexit in Ireland. But, but as, as, as uh, both Karen and myself have, have pointed out, there is a lot of uncertainty around these estimates. Um, we, we simply don't have prior good examples. I mean, there have been examples of, of countries and, and that breaking up in, in the past, but there's no recent examples of countries leaving such a deep and closely integrated block like the EU that we've been able to draw on. Um, there is also arguably even more uncertainty around the, the, the short run estimates. Um, um, again, because we just don't know if, if there's no consensus on when, whether any adjustment will be more sudden or more gradual uh, to, 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 the, to the new uh, relationship between the, the UK and the EU. So I think one of the reasons that maybe some of the short-term forecasts, in addition to all that uncertainty, is, is that, that, that they are being revised down because we, we seem to be in this kind of wait-and-see period. So I think you're, you're, um, you know, potentially firms are, are delaying investment decisions and, and so on. Um, because they're, they're waiting to see what the outcome of this could be. And we actually see that, uh, for instance, Deputy, in the... Um, we do a consumer sentiment indicator, uh, have done for a good few years, and it's quite significant, the downturn in consumer sentiment since, you know, October, November of last year. And it seems, I mean, we haven't done, you know, enough empirical analysis yet, but, like, it, it does seem very much that, obviously, the, the, the decline in consumer sentiment domestically seems to be almost directly linked to when you had the heightened reference to no deal uh, as far as this whole issue is concerned. So if consumer sentiment is trending downward to the extent that it is, that almost inevitably has a knock-on impact on consumption. So, you know, Brexit is already uh, impacting the, the, the domestic economy. Thank you very much, Deputy. Um, our next is Deputy Boyd Barish. Yeah, just uh, how, how sort of granular, if you like, is your, um, your analysis of uh, the various impacts, uh, primarily negative, as you've described, but also the potential uh, positives um, in terms of different sectors, Deputy Chambers asked about different regions, but in terms of different sectors uh, and how they might be impacted negatively or positively. And I mean, without in any way trying to underestimate the difficulties all of this proposes, and I would imagine that the sectors have already been mentioned, agri-food and um, tourism, likely to take a particular hit but do if if uh, sterling falls obviously that makes our exports more expensive to britain but uh you know unlikely to hit exports to britain uh, you know to what extent may that be mitigated by cheaper imports of certain things 
uh, and potential boosts to if in terms of the costs of production for certain industries which rely heavily on British imports you know is that factored in or uh, you know if you like the balance of certain things becoming more expensive but other things becoming cheaper even in household goods I mean I, I think we possibly import in or around the same amount of food and drink as we export to Britain or you know you, you could probably tell me more about that uh, so like ha, is that factored in in trying to work out what the impact might be uh, of different um, uh, the, you know the costs of things and how that that could then impact on households employment and uh, the cost of production for industry I mean, on the uh, Sterling issue, maybe Adele will, 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 will take that. I suppose, the, just to kind of give a very brief overview, the way we, we've looked at Brexit really over the last few years is we, we've kind of taken the, initially the, the large-scale macro model, very highly aggregated, and then, as I said, there's been a series of more micro-level analysis that have been produced using more micro-level data, drilling down into um, issues like the, the sectoral issues, the, the issues that you're talking about, um, the sectors of the economy that would be most impacted in terms of imports, exports, the potential of WTO tariffs being applied to specific sectors in the UK economy, the resulting impact on, on imports and, and exports in an Irish context as a result of that. Uh, and then the other piece of work that I, that I referred to earlier by my colleague Martina Lawless was looking at the household expenditure. So looking at detailed household expenditure levels uh, for a, you know, standard kind of uh, nationally representative uh, household expenditure levels and looking at the impact of that on, of Brexit, looking at the impact if you had tariffs being applied to certain products, the implications then for household budgets as a result of that. And in that you can do obviously the mean and the average, but you can obviously look at the distributional effects as well in terms of which are the households that are most impacted by that. So we've had that analysis and then the recent analysis is where we've kind of Again, going back to the large-scale macro model, so we can factor in the trade issues between the UK and Ireland, the UK and Europe, and Europe and Ireland, etc. But we've also aggregated up from some of the micro-level work. Um, so that's kind of feeding in in a number of different ways into the, the present analysis. But as to your question about the, um, the how granular the analysis is, it, it, like this analysis has fed off a lot of very granular. Uh, pieces of work that have been done using firm level data and household level data to specifically, I think, address the questions that you're, that you're referring to. On, on the sterling yes, issue and, and just, how just Maybe just to come in and, and uh, just one other point on that. So, as, as Karen said, we're, we're really looking at the overall macro impact from this, and there, but there is a lot of other research that, that we are drawing from and the other research that has shown that it is particular sectors like the agri-food sector and the indigenous um, uh, SME sector will be particularly affected and um, certain regions uh, uh, as well so um on the, on the issue around sterling uh, yeah it makes our our, our exports more competitive or less competitive and um, at the same time in terms of our imports you, you, you also have to factor in the um, take into account the fact that there will be tariffs non-tariff measures and um, potential disruptions to supply chain um, that are likely to outweigh any anything on on the exchange rate side. Um, so um, just on on SMEs, so many of them who who export export primarily to to, to to the UK. The UK is also a really important source of intermediate goods. Um, uh, for for that are used in in later stages of production. So if you have any kind of, of disruption to that supply chain, the, the cost associated with that is likely to, to be much more substantial than, than the, the, the fluctuation in the currency. I suppose the bottom line answer at an aggregate level to, to your point is that if you look at the results you see, it's both exports and imports are, are significantly impacted. And so overall, to, that to a certain extent can mitigate the overall impact on GDP because obviously the exports come down that drags uh, GDP down, but if imports go down, then that keeps GDP reasonably high. So th there's an offset there, but it's obviously it's more within the, at the, the granular level in terms of the sectors of the economy. Uh, as Adele says, most SMEs, their trade is with the UK for those that export in, in an Irish context. And then going back to the whole sectoral issue in terms of it's the agri-food sector, food processing sector, tourism, 
uh, etc., um, where there is significant regional differences in terms of the reliance of the economy on these particular sectors. Uh, that's where I suppose the real story lies in many respects. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next, I have Deputy Pierce Doherty. Um, I guess well, she. I want to go through just a, a couple of uh, questions um, quickly. The, the, the ESRI's outlook is um, more modest compared to some of the other outlooks in terms of the Department of Finance or the Central Bank. Can you explain this to us and what, in your view, is the biggest mitigating factors in the more modest assessment presented by the ESRI? Is it solely the FDI diversion uh, or is there other other components that uh, allow you to suggest a more modest outcome? Thanks. That's the first question. Um, okay. Th thanks, Deputy, for, for, for that question. So there, there are a series of, of studies that have looked at the impact of, of, of Brexit for, for Ireland. Um, I, I think that the, the first point to make is that we they're all consistent in the sense that they all find a significant negative impact for Ireland. Um, I suppose in, in terms of taking, say, our disorderly no-deal scenario, our long-run impact um, for, for Ireland is that, that, is that the level of output would be around 5% lower, below where it otherwise would have been. There is other studies out there, so I think there's a study from the OECD from last year. They have in a, dis, in a disorderly scenario that the long-run impact will be around 2.5%. Um, Central Bank have, um, I think, 6% lower in the long run. Um, so, th so there are other estimates out there. I think we're somewhere within the, the, the range of, of estimates. Um, if um, I, 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 I don't have the details of, of what exactly the Central Bank did, but um, I, I would imagine that they had a, a, a slightly more negative trade shock um, to, 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 to come up with it with a longer, with a, um, to come up with their minus 6% in the long run compared to our minus 5. Um, in terms of differences maybe in, in, on the short term forecasts or the short run uh, implications for, for Brexit, so Kieran, who, who, who heads up our, our, quarter, our short term forecasting team in the, in the quarterly economic commentary, um, their most recent projections for 2019 and 20. Uh, in the apps, if, if Brexit didn't happen, or for 3.8 and 3.2 percent growth, but that falls to 1.2 and 2.4 percent in in the event of a, of a disorderly Brexit. I think the central bank's estimates for the two years are probably a little bit closer to 1 percent. So they're they're quite consistent. And um, when when we're talking around the short run impact, there is more um, there, there is more uncertainty. Um, and there is also an element of judgment in there as, 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 as well. So um, I, I, I would suspect that maybe, I can't speak for the central bank, but I would suspect that maybe they have additional disruption. How, how, how likely is it, given the, the long lead into Brexit and all of the machinations that are happening over in, 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 in Westminster and what's flowing out from the different council meetings, that the markets have already now priced this in? that you know, where we get the biggest disruption is where there's a shock, an unprecedented or unexpected mm -hmm. event. Uh, are we likely to have seen, given that, it's, you know, that there's been a long lead into a possible no-deal Brexit, that it's, the shock is already now kind of factored in, or is that a factor in your assessment? Uh, I, I certainly think that's, that's always the case, I suppose, to a large extent with financial markets. You know, they, they obviously tend to be very attentive to that type of issue and, and factoring in risk almost in anticipation of the event. I think it goes back maybe a little bit, Deputy, I suppose, the, the way I'd answer it in terms of the impacts on the real economy. Um, I go back to the point I made in relation to the kind of things like the Consumer Sentiment Index um, uh, and a related index that we do on investment, um, uh, savings and investment index. And both of those, as I, as I said earlier, have kind of been trending, particularly the consumer sentiment, been trend, trending down quite markedly since the midpoint of last year. Um, so that, um, you know, the, clearly the, the heightened reference and the growing, the growing kind of attention around the whole issue of a no-deal Brexit and the, the, the increased possibility of that certainly has had a negative and adverse impact already on consumption behaviour, I would say, in the in domestic economy and on investment decisions. Now, Part of the issue, I think, in the Irish economy's case is that because the economy 
uh, and, and maybe even before that, maybe even not just in the last six months. Uh, I think possibly the issue in the Irish economy is that because the economy has been growing so strongly yeah. uh, over the last couple of years that we've almost not detected the impact of Brexit already. But I would argue that it already is there uh, in terms of its impact. Um, I think, so certainly on things like financial markets, I think clearly they would be able to factor in so that would mitigate the possibility, you know, or, or maybe restrict the possibility of a really sharp financial sector shock. But I think ultimately, and what the analysis shows, that it's, it's more in the real economy, real economy is clearly where Brexit is going to be uh, felt the most. Uh, there were some of the headlines time. that came out, and indeed we heard it, you know, again uh, today, you know, that this is Brexit creates the biggest turmoil in our, in our lifetime, but that, that mm. isn't the case. Like, the, you know, some of the headlines that were presented in the past was that this was as big as the banking crash, and, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't fall into the halfpenny place of, of what happened when, uh, uh, you know, pre mm. previous governments drove the economy off the cliff. So maybe just to give a, a context in relation to what we've went through in terms of that type of crash that we experienced 10 years ago yeah. uh, and Brexit. But the, the, one of the significant headline figures in, in your report was the impact on potential job growth and, and job losses and that there would be 80,000 less jobs in the economy in the context of a no-deal scenario. What was the factors that led you to revise that upwards from 55,000 to, to 80,000? Um, I, I, that's uh, the, 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 the original, I think, estimate, or previous estimate was 55, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, and in relation to the sectors, there was a bit of discussion in relation to the food sector and so on and so forth. But in relation to the regions, I, I've seen some stuff, and I haven't been able to get hold of um, uh, Edgar um, Morgan Roth's report, but he's done some drilling down, if I'm right, in terms of the impact on production and manufacturing jobs in particular regions. I'm looking at my own county, which mm. already has, right now, has an impact on jobs as a result of Brexit because contracts are being lost in my own parish. Um, jobs are being lost or layoffs are, are, are taking place and that's not isolated, it's actually happening uh, across the board. The, the, the Killy Beggs, for example, the quota's been caught. The, yeah. factories are, uh, the factories are idle, mm. the people are, are laid off because they weren't sure whether they could catch this quota mm. uh, after a Brexit scenario, so there's a huge impact. Okay, so can I ask you just to talk about the regional impact in terms of jobs um, there, and the last question, um, the, well, the, the, there's expected a no-deal scenario, there would be a higher prices for export goods, but there would also be a higher higher cost in terms of production internally. Uh, so where do you see, uh, the, do you see a significant impact on inflation uh, as a result of, 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 of Brexit scenario? And the last point was the ESRI's forecast of uh, a potential gain of 26 billion in, in FDI, um, nearly 8% of the uh, overspill of FDI as a result of, from Britain. Um, can you walk us through the type of um, FDI that you're, you expect, and are we seeing the signs of that already, that spillover already flowing into to Ireland, and, in, and if we are, in what scale? Thank you. Here's maybe I'll take the turmoil versus the, and then the regional one. And yeah, yeah um, Debbie, I think the, and this goes back to a, an earlier point, I, I think, uh, in respect to the Deputy Bruin's point about the, um, you know, being sanguine about the impacts. I mean, it's one of the things that I was particularly, I suppose, we were all particularly concerned about in terms of the analysis. And as I said, one of the things we, one of the exercises that we looked at um, in, in the modelling exercise was to kind of say, well, you know, because Brexit primarily comes through the trade channel, uh, although not exclusively, but primarily comes through the trade channel, what kind of trade shock would we need to get to get the kind of collapse in the economy that we saw after 2008? And the answer is huge and substantial. And because, again, going back, and I think this was in reference to uh, Deputy Barrett, because both exports and imports would be impacted, you don't get quite the same impact, clearly. Uh, you know, your exports fall, GDP falls, but your imports also fall, so your GDP goes up. Um, the 2008 crash was completely different because you had just this massive credit bubble. And once that was burst, um, as we all know, because the construction sector had you know, seeped into all aspects of, of almost all, nearly all sectors of the economy, once that collapsed, it was just a, 
an overwhelming collapse in the economy and an overwhelming collapse in GDP, overwhelming collapse in tax revenues, uh, etc. So I don't think you're talking about something like that. But I mean, I think that the only point I would make is that the collapse, the credit bubble collapse, was over a, a short, relatively short, sustained period of time, three to four years. Whereas Brexit will impact the economy potentially over 10, 50, well, you know, possibly a lifetime because of the missed opportunities. So if you were to accumulate it all up uh, in the long run, uh, it could have the same impact. But certainly it's, it's a more persistent loss to the economy over a longer period of time than the kind of short, sharp, really bad hit that we took after 2008, 2009. On the regional work, again, yeah, going back to, I mean, this is the stuff that, that Edgar and Martina Lawless did. Uh, and I think, as I was saying earlier on, the, the thing that struck me about that, that work when it came out was obviously, you know, you naturally kind of um, agree with the scenario that it was agriculture and agri-food and tourism and, and those related sectors which were impacted. But the interesting aspect to their work was they pointed out that, you know, agriculture uh, is not just something that, that impacts the, the border regions, etc. It also impacts other parts of the economy you wouldn't necessarily think about. You know, South Munster uh, area is very heavily reliant on agriculture, uh, as we know, a very strong dairy sector in those parts. Uh, other parts of the economy or other parts of the country that would be very heavily reliant on the beef sector. These are all areas which could be very substantially impacted uh, by Brexit. And you'd get, you, know, you could get these real significant differences in a regional context where Dublin may in overall and in aggregate terms may do okay in a Brexit scenario if you have a lot of FDI coming in and particularly if you have a lot of disruption to the financial sector in, in London and it relocates to Dublin but it's the it's the regional element to it and the regional diversity and, and heterogeneity across the country which I think as I said earlier that's where the real uh, re real story is in. Um, I've seen graphs about like shown county by county and it was like 8% reduction in manufacturing and production jobs mm. in Donegal, for example. Yeah, and I mean, that's huge. It. And is that the, is that the, because I wasn't able to get the source of that uh, report, but is that the figures that we're looking at? Like it was, I think the border belt was the, 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 the largest impacted, but there was also a lot of other regions. And oh, it was yeah, in yeah, the region yeah. of 8%, 8 to 9% of, uh, of, of jobs in manufacturing production. I mean, it's, it's clearly the border area is, is the area that would be most impacted. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, the, the fact that agriculture and other sectors that are going to be impacted uh, most significantly uh, is in other parts of the country that you wouldn't necessarily think about. I suppose that was the thing that struck me from the analysis. I almost took for granted that the border area was going to be the most impacted, obviously, by it. But uh, clearly, yeah, you could have very significant implications in that sense. I um, yeah, I might just come in on a couple of the other points uh, that, that, that you raised, Deputy. Um, you, you were asking about the, the long-run impact on jobs mm -hmm. and why that was different from our previous study. Um, I, I suppose that, that the last study we did was right after the referendum in the, in the U, happened in, in the UK. And I suppose since then there's been a huge amount of research uh, done on Brexit that, that we've drawn on. Um, so I think really we, we now have a better understanding of, of, of the way that Brexit will, will, will impact the economy. Um, so uh, another question you asked was, was around FDI. I suppose a lot of the, most of the work actually done, done on Brexit, unsurprisingly, is, is actually done in the UK. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a big consensus in, um, across, in, across research in the UK that the UK, as a result of Brexit, is likely to lose around a quarter of its FDI over, over the long term. Um, so what we, tried to, what we tried to do in this paper was to see, well, what sectors are they likely to lose in? And as, 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 as I think we're all aware, Ireland is already a very attractive destination for FDI. So we said if we look at the kind of losses that the UK um, are likely to experience that, and then we assume that Ireland is able to, to get some of that in the sort of, on the basis of the, the, its current share, in, in terms of EU FDI, that, that, that seems uh, a plausible assumption. So I think that the UK is expected to lose in computers, electronics, optical products, chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And so these are some of the uh, uh, sectors that, that we think that Ireland could gain in, uh, also in the uh, financial intermediation sector. You asked if there's any evidence of this so far. I'm, I'm not aware. I do know, I think, um, uh, various, um, there's been reports, <coughs> more, anecdotal. Uh, more anecdotal reports that, that, that people have been yeah. 
uh, especially on the, on the financial uh, uh, sector side, that, that, that various um, applications and that have been made, but, but we, we were not too sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Joan Burton. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks as always for your very interesting comments. Um, can I ask you, in the context of the all island economy, which I think is very significant now, did you have any specific look at the likely impact of uh, outturns on Northern Ireland? I know you're not responsible, as it were, for Northern Ireland, but it's just that, in terms of all the border counties on the uh, southern side, as well as all the northern counties uh, in, in Northern Ireland, it just seems to me that the interactions are very intense. And um, I was just wondering if, if you can cast any light uh, on how bad you think the impact might be on uh, the north, uh, because certainly a lot of business people in the north are really scared, as are the trade unions. Um, secondly, then, um, I uh, would um, perceive that a lot of small firms are completely at sea. Um, my, my, my background is an accountant, and um, I, people constantly asking me, what do I think they're going to have to do? And, you know, I kind of explain it to them that, you know, in a small three to five person firm, like a little agribusiness, it's likely to be a whole extra set of tax returns or equivalent. In that context, I was a bit surprised at an answer I got the week before last from the Minister for Finance that there are only roughly 210 revenue staff in the counties uh, in the south on the border uh, who are customs and excise people and compliance people. Now, we've all heard repeatedly about the four to 600 people who are being recruited. Um, did anyone say, ask yourselves in the ESRI to maybe go along and see what they're doing and what they say will happen, whether, like nobody wants it on the border, but just let's say it's some distance away or whatever, uh, as to how we, how we actually actively get ready and advise people what they might have to do. Um, because I think that's, that, that knowledge gap is very intense for small businesses, but also I think for businesses close to the border on either side of the border. Um, I'm also aware of the fact that there's a very big fall off as far as a lot of hotels in Ireland are concerned, but again, particularly along the border. There seems to be a big fall off in bookings from Britain. Do you have any way of monitoring that? Um, now, I know uh, people are working really hard to make up for those bookings uh, from, uh, from other sources, but do you have any uh, information or intelligence on that? And I suppose the final one would be, how low does sterl sterling, how low is sterling do you think likely to go? Um, I know, uh, I think papers like the Financial Times have been constantly surprised that maybe because of um, uh, um, stocking up on goods, the UK economy hasn't fallen that much. But have you looked at that? And if that kind of falls back, once, if, if the deed actually happens? Um, and also then, of the alternatives uh, to the withdrawal agreement, like what would be your bottom line of what would be the least worst thing for us, the combo of the you know, single market customs union and a few other things, uh, because we may just have to find language, as has been done in lots of other agreements, that uh, sets that out in a slightly different format. Um, sorry, uh, maybe maybe just you've asked. Sorry, a, a whole series of questions there. So maybe I'll begin, and, and Kieran might 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 jump in at various places. Um, in terms of the, the the best outcome for Ireland is is simply for the UK to stay in the EU. Um, so after that, the the next best outcome for Ireland is whatever keeps them as closely aligned as possible to the EU. So the, the current withdrawal agreement does allow for a customs union, it does allow for, for a free trade agreement um, as, as well. So whatever, and, and whatever language is used, I mean, I know there's various different 
uh, uh, types of things have been proposed um, in, in the UK in, in recent weeks. And the, the, the best one for Ireland is the one that keeps the, 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 the UK as closely aligned as possible to the EU. Um, on on your, your question about sterling, um, uh, we have the uh, depreciation in sterling um, uh, at around 7% in, in the long run in our kind of no deal and, and deal scenarios, or no, in our two no deal scenarios, um, around half that in, in the deal scenario. So I think that, that puts sterling at, in, in, the, in the worst case scenario, at around 95p. Um, but it could be, um, in, the, in the very short run, you can imagine that, that, that it could go to, to, to parity. Um, on, on some of your other questions, and, and Kieran might want to come in on some of this as well, um, th there's actually most of the, the, the work on Brexit that refers to the UK doesn't really distinguish between the, 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 the Northern Ireland and, and, and so on. So, Just on that, could yeah. I just ask you a sub-question? Within the North, is there a separate statistical capacity? There, there, there's, there, there, there certainly used to be, but I'm not, I'm not as, as aware. I don't. Um, I know. I, I just uh, kind of anecdotally, I know a colleague of mine was asking me about models for Northern Ireland, and, and my, my answer to that was, I'm not aware of one. Now that, that, hmm. um, I, I, I could be wrong on that. So um, uh, most of the studies tend to, to report uh, an aggregate impact for, for the UK. I mean, I think I remember saying. Um, at the some commentaries ago, um, and you know, it, it was more, I suppose, uh, reflecting the, the kind of the your dismay at the stance that certain parties in, in, in Northern Ireland were taking, as far as this issue was concerned. That you know, really, of all of the economies, if you want to call them different regional economies in, in these islands, it was the economy in Northern Ireland that was most likely to be impacted the most in the most mm -hmm. significant fashion as a result of Brexit, because they would have, you know. At least in our case, we were still going to be members of the European Union after yeah. all, of, all of this had settled down. Whereas Northern Ireland, which has a very heavy reliance on agri-food, as we know, um, you know, was facing the uncertainty of not just, you know, uh, of, of, of all of the, the, the uncertainties that we were facing into, but it was also left in the situation potentially of not being in the European Union. And, um, you know, we all know substantial amount of payments that come from the, the common agricultural policy, and these are very important, particularly in rural areas. And there's huge uncertainty about, you know, what would happen to those kinds of payments if Northern Ireland, as well as the, the rest of the UK, were to leave uh, leave the European Union. So, uh, I mean, as an economy, on, on, in its own terms, um, it would be particularly impacted, even compared to ourselves. Um, our colleague, our former colleague, John Fitzgerald, has done. Uh, some work looking at the whole nature of the All Ireland economy. I think he gave a presentation on it there before Christmas, um, and you know he pointed to the fact that not just about Brexit and its impact on Northern Ireland, but Northern Ireland's performance in general hasn't been exactly stellar over mm -hmm. the last 20 years. Um, you know, and he's pointed out that you know despite the fact that there's been a significant amount of transfers, uh, you know, in terms of the Good Friday uh, agreement, etc., that it really you haven't seen a, any kind of significant improvement in the underlying performance of the economy there. That also goes towards another point that you were saying about the UK. I mean, we also, you were saying, you know, some argument that the UK economy hasn't fallen that much, but I think if you look at the underlying situation, it is quite worrying yes, yeah. in the UK. They've had a productivity problem in the UK for some years now that's predated Brexit. Uh, and I think all the, all the signs are that Brexit, if it does go ahead, would only exacerbate those kind of issues. So, I, I, you know, we'd be particularly concerned, I suppose, about the outcome uh, of, of, of Brexit as far as Northern Ireland's economy is concerned and, and the knock-on effect on, on, on the overall economy of, of the island of Ireland because of the increasingly integrated nature across, across the border. So I think it is a real, uh, it is a real concern. Um, on some of your more specific points, we, we don't really tend to have... Um, you know, some of the, the more, I suppose, the most micro-level information we have are the kind of the indicators, the, the sentiment indicators that I talked about, the consumer sentiment indicators, the investment indicators. We don't quite have that level of granularity in terms of looking at individual sectors like, you know, hotel bookings and things like that, but those all inevitably feed in, I suppose, to some of these sentiment, uh, sentiment indicators. And as I said, certainly on the consumer sentiment, 
uh, but also even on the investment sentiment, it's clear that you can see a downward trajectory in those indicators over the last six or seven months. And in particularly in the, sent in the consumer sentiment case, it's quite a sharp decline. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Deputy. Um, there is, we have no further deputies offering, so can I take on behalf of the Committee the opportunity to thank you very much uh, for your attendance here today, um, Dr. Adelberg and Professor Kieran McQuinn. Uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity to go through it with you. Um, I, I, I think it's, Brexit is something that will be with us, no doubt, <laughs> in some context for a long time to come still, uh, regardless of the outcome of what happens in the next few days. So thank you again very much. Uh, there being no further business, we will conclude and our committee will now stand adjourned until the 18th of April at 2.15pm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.